Okay, we're recording. Okay. Today's April 6th, 2015. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And with me today is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer with the History Center, and Sue Verhoff, who is a senior archivist at the History Center. We're honored to have with us today Mr. Bill McManus. Mr. McManus is a veteran of World War II, and he's kindly agreed to come in here and tell us his story about his life and particularly his experiences during World War II. And we're also honored to have Mr. McManus's friend, uh, Chief Shepard, who is here and uh, is a very good friend of Mr. McManus and may have some questions or some observations during the interview. And we welcome any input you have. Mr. McManus, would you uh, give us your full name and the city and state where you were born? Well, I, my name is William A. McManus. I was born in New York City on June the 17th, 1923. Uh, I was raised mostly in Tampa, Florida, where I attended uh, junior high and senior high school and went on to the University of Florida at Gainesville in 1940 and 41. Uh, I completed one year and uh, uh, second semester, uh, uh, first semester of the second year, uh, I was, uh, I had already volunteered for the United States Air Corps. At that point it was not Air Force, but it was the U.S. Army Air Corps. And uh, so they decided they wanted me to uh, come to, to join them and learn how to fly. Um, which I, I did. I was uh, sent to uh, basic training, uh, which was in Miami Beach. Uh, I went from there to uh, San Antonio, Texas, where they had a classification center, and you class the, the, uh, the, the, the men who were, uh, had volunteered as being either a potential pilot or bombardier or a navigator and uh, I wanted to be a pilot and uh, they fortunately they accepted me for that and uh, uh, I was sent <clears throat> from San Antonio Texas to several places in Texas in training uh, as you start out with a little airplane and then you have a little bit bigger airplane and finally you get one that was uh, uh, quite large and uh, I, I learned to fly and got my wings in Eagle Pass, Texas uh, in June of uh, 1944, I believe it was. And uh, <coughs> uh, it was not long afterwards that I was assigned to a group who were being trained for a four-engine bombardment. Uh, I wanted to be a fighter pilot. I was anxious, really, to fly a, 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 a must a P P-51 is what I wanted to fly, and uh, they they had too many volunteers for that, uh, and and uh, so uh, the result was that they put me in a heavy bombardment in B-24, and. Uh, we finally were trained for what they call a preparation for overseas movement, and that was done in uh, uh, my mind is <laughs> a blank. Uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to remember the name of the it was out west. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> we were given the overseas movement. And we were sent from there to, uh, that was in Wyoming, okay. Casper, Wyoming, was okay. where I was trying to remember. Okay. And from Casper, uh, I was sent to uh, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. And in Lincoln, Nebraska, we were assigned to a brand new plane and a crew. Everybody was congregated there. We all got our uh, various equipment that we needed. And uh, we were then uh, on our 
way to uh, combat. Okay, before we get to the next step, what type of plane was it that you were assigned to? I was assigned to a B-24. Okay. B-24 Liberator. Okay. And um, I want to back up a little bit. Um, tell us about your experience the day Pearl Harbor was attacked. How did you oh, find out? Okay. What was your reaction? All right. Well, I was in Tampa, Florida. Uh, <clears throat> I guess at that time I was barely 18 when uh, the Japanese on that Sunday, I will never forget, that they, they bombed Pearl Harbor. Uh, and the, the thought in my mind at that time, most of the things that we were able to buy in various stores that came from Japan was literally junk. Uh, it was, they had very bad reputation. The stuff that they had was not anything. And, and we just couldn't understand really how could a nation that produced such junky stuff, how could they expect to, to challenge a nation like the United States? Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. I felt like, well, this is just, this just couldn't last long because those people just, of course, that was a, a very, very bad uh, mistake on my part. They, they were uh, a, a, a real, sure enough, competitor, and we, did, we found that out. But <clears throat> in any event, uh, everything moved along pretty fast after December. 1941. How did your parents feel about you going into the military? Well, uh, uh, Joe, the, the people in my generation, uh, when when the Japanese uh, hit Pearl Harbor, uh, I think all of us felt that uh, 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 this is something that we have to do. Uh, you know, it it, it wasn't something, well, you should do it or shouldn't do it. Everybody, everybody was behind that effort. I, I believe, I don't know of a single soul, never met a single soul who was against going into the military. Everybody wanted to get in. They wanted to go in yeah. and to stop these crazy people in yeah. uh, Germany and uh, yeah. Japan and, uh, and rid the world of such uh, uh, cruel, yeah. uh, inhuman yeah. people, yeah. and uh, so I, I, as far as uh, my parents were concerned, uh, there was no, no uh, reluctance on their part, yeah. Yeah. no reticence of any kind that I was ever aware of, and or anyone else. Yeah. And I know of people who would have loved to have gotten into the service, but for one reason or another, could not. Yeah. And and when that happened. They went into the war effort, and they did everything they could yeah. to uh, enhance the war effort. That was a good feeling to know that everybody was behind you. Wasn't Absolutely, it? Oh. and uh, uh, there was no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, the amount that the people were doing, I'll never forget. Uh, <clears throat> there was a German uh, submarine captain, and uh, he was uh, being admonished by one of his superiors. Uh, they, were, they were not getting enough uh, torpedoes to, to um, sink all these ships that were being sent over as uh, supplies for our troops. And, his, and the submarine commander says, well, they're building the ships faster than we can sink them. Wow. And that was due to people. As there, was, there was one out in, in California, as I remember. They were turning out a Liberty ship every day. Gee. Can you think of that? A yep. ship, a big Liberty ship. But they, 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 that was, you can think of the number of people behind that and yeah. all of the various things that had to be done to produce that ship, and they did. So they were shooting, they were building them faster than they could think. Yeah. So I thought that was good, and that maybe that answers it your does. question. It does, that's very descriptive. <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> Did you know where you were going when you first went overseas? Did they tell you where you were going to be? Uh, no, we did not. We we knew our route to go, and uh, the the route that we took 
<coughs> was rather cold. It was, uh, I think this was November of 1944. And we flew from uh, where we got our plane in Lincoln and we flew to New Hampshire and I believe I was about as cold in New Hampshire as I've ever been in my <laughs> life. Uh, we went from there to uh, Goose Bay, Labrador, sure. and from Goose Bay, Labrador, we went to Reykjavik, Iceland. This was uh, pretty cold, yeah. the wind blowing pretty good at that time. <laughs> and uh, from uh, Reykjavik, Iceland, we, we uh, refueled and we flew from there to a little t uh, field in Wales, and uh, I believe it was in Wales where we got our uh, destination charge. Uh -huh. So, and our destination was uh, for in the 15th Air Force uh, to be in Italy. When we were based in southern Italy, yeah. uh, which we did, we went uh, from uh, from that little place in Wales. We went. Uh, to Morocco and uh, Tunis, where they recently had some big trouble, which we didn't have when we were there, thank goodness. <laughs> and uh, from Tunis, we, from, we flew north uh, over to our little uh, town in, uh, in Italy. Let me ask you about going to places like Tunis. Did you have any time to go out and see we, the populace? We did. and. Uh, there were four of us uh, that, uh, that were officers on our crew, and uh, we had a, as I remember, we had a day or two in Tunis, and uh, we decided it would be nice to do a little sightseeing. Um, <clears throat> first off, we decided we'd go to a movie, and uh, so <clears throat> before the movie started, there were, there were, there were lots and lots of uh, uh, Arab people uh, they had the uh, long white things on, and they were all congregated out in front of this theater. And uh, then this, this great big fella with a little red little thing on his hot top, and he must have been six four or six five, and he spotted us back there. So he just sort of cut a line through, and he got he got to us. He said, "Will you gentlemen?" In perfect English, would you gentlemen like to, like to come to the movie? Yes. Really? So he was come right through with all those people really? and put us up in this thing. Wow. And I remember we were seeing some movie, and we were we were sitting in the balcony, and uh, there was a, there was something about the Japanese, and the the the, the uh, Arab people, as soon as they saw the Japanese, they began to hiss. Oh. They hissed. You know, they really, really, they didn't like the Japanese. <laughs> and uh, they, were, we were, they were on our side. <laughs> well, that had to make you feel pretty good. Yeah. Uh, the second thing that happened whenever we decided we would go out to Carthage, which was a, 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 a suburb of Tunis. Uh, you may, may remember there was a guy named Hannibal from, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, he was a Carthaginian. Yeah. And uh, we learned that there was a tram that went from from Tunis to Carthage. So the four of us uh, got uh, on the tram and we rode out there. And there were, <coughs> were a number of, uh, of the great big Arab fellows with, with a little red thing on there. They were standing around. They had uh, little kind of like rickshaws with horse-drawn so we figured that was a, uh, we could get in one of those and go around. So we began to negotiate uh, a price to see how much it would be to go around and see the ruins. So <clears throat> one of our, our, our crew members, our, our uh, navigator, was born in Quebec. And he said, now I speak French, uh, haltingly, but uh, I speak it. and." That's what these people will understand. So let me do the, uh, the all the reckoning about how much this was going to cost. So <clears throat> we w he would say in, uh, in French, we'll try to find out how much it was going to be, and back and forth. 
And then these four fellows, the Arabs, would then talk Ar Ar Arabic, trying to figure out what had, this fellow had said. <laughs> well, that went on, I guess, 20 minutes. <laughs> After which, one of these Arabs, in the most beautiful English I've ever heard, said, now, what I understand, you, you four guys want to go around this. So that was the way. <laughs> that was, <laughs> and there we were with our, you know, American uniforms. On, so there wasn't any question in their minds about whether we understood the English or not. That's good. But <clears throat> we did, and uh, and then from there, we flew from uh, from Tunis on into uh, um, uh, our base in in Italy. And uh, I, I will never forget that uh, the, uh, the, the day we arrived, uh, one of our uh, B-24s was returning from uh, combat, and they were unable to uh, lower their landing gears and their landing flaps. Uh, and uh, so they <clears throat> and we have a steel matted runway. Uh, so what they did is they bailed out. We watched this thing, and this, this was our first day in combat. <laughs> you know. We watched these guys. Uh, they bailed out everybody except the pilot, and the co-pilot, and the engineer. And uh, then they brought that plane in a lot faster than they would normally do because they normally would use the flaps and the wheels and the, would reduce the speed, the speed of the plane significantly. But those boys, they brought that thing in and they slid it on that steel matted runway and they didn't even bend the prop on that plane. Gee, yes. And we, we was a, it was a great thing. We, we, everybody was cheering yeah, like that. <laughs> like somebody had just won the World Series. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, that, was, that was our first day of, okay. of arriving in, in Italy. Where were you in Italy, uh, approximately? We, we were uh, in near. We <laughs> we weren't any place really in Italy. <laughs> we were on a mountainside. Uh, there was two mountains. Uh, you, may, you may want to call them hills, but anyway, uh, and in between there was a little valley, and that's where they had uh, seal matted runway, five thousand feet. Huh. And on one hill they had one bomb group, and on the other hill they had another bomb group. Yeah. And it was near a little town called Canosa, C-A-N-O-S-A. Okay. And that was a, a 446 bomb group uh, that I was in okay. uh, in Italy. Well, talk about your experiences from that point forward. Just right. what you saw, what you yeah. did, yeah. just your well, recollection of that period when you were overseas? Well, uh, what we saw um, living on this hill, we were assigned a tent and uh, we didn't have any real accommodations other than that, but the, the, uh, we did have flooring on it and sometimes some siding. Uh, and we put in that tent that we would have as many as five cots. Our, our, our sleeping condition was a, this was a, a canvas cot that had, I guess, three of these things with a stretched canvas over there. Yeah. And uh, we were given that in a sleeping bag. Uh, <laughs> and we were, there was no heat, of course. And it was cold, it was snow sometimes uh, in in Italy. In fact, we were called down several times, not able to fly because of snow and the weather not being good. But we we did heat the thing. Finally, they they used to take 55 gallon <coughs> oil drums and cut them in half, and they have put a little hinge on the door. And then from some of these broken planes that we had, they would run a gas line with a hundred octane gas from outside in, and they would drop that on the put. They had a little sand on the inside, and they but they would put a little of that in and then stop it, and, and then throw a match in, and it would boom. <laughs> and uh, 
and then we turned the thing on and let it drip kind of slowly, and and that was our heat, okay. and uh, it it kept us from freezing. But yeah. that that was how we huh. how we managed to live. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, we did, and we had a we had an officers' club in which um, we got our meals there. And uh, they had a fellow that would come in from it was an Italian fellow that would cut our hair, uh, and uh, there was no such thing as a, a shower. If you wanted to get yourself clean, you you had a, have a helmet and you got it, put the water in the helmet and kind of heated it over that thing that I'm telling you about, yeah. and then you sort of washed yourself <laughs> off, and that was how we kept yeah. Yeah. halfway clean. Yeah. But that was it. <laughs> But from there, talking about uh, uh, maybe a, a combat experience. Before you, I, I want to be sure we've got the time right. Is this 1944? But 19, November. November 1944. November 1944. Okay. okay. And, uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I guess it was, uh, we began to fly our missions uh, almost immediately, and uh, I I remember that I was assigned at almost it was almost Christmas time, and I I was a, a assigned a, 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 a mission. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, I was sick. I knew I was sick. I had a fever, and uh, so the the uh, doctor that was assigned to our Group said, "Well, you uh, you have to you have to you go down for this mission. You can't do that." So I, what it was, I'm sure, was either bronchitis or the flu, and they put us in a, 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 a that little town of Canosa, which was about three or four miles down the road, I guess. Anyway, they had a schoolhouse there, and they cleared one of those rooms, and we had to, about I guess 15 or 20 beds of that thing, and uh, we got uh, aspirin tablets. I get, took two every four or six hours or something, mm -hmm. and that was the treatment that we got. <laughs> but <clears throat> I do remember that that Christmas, uh, we had somebody had a radio, and uh, I remember Bing Crosby wow. was singing, I'll be home for Christmas. Wow. You can count on me. Sure. And there wasn't everybody in that in that whole thing that wasn't crying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was among them. <laughs> yeah. I could understand but, that. But anyway, I got got better and uh, went, reassigned to duty, and uh, we <clears throat> we were going on a mission, and uh, <clears throat> the uh, the Germans at that time were dug in in the, in the Apennine Mountains, the Apennine Mountains being somewhere around central uh, Italy. Uh, above them is called the, uh, the Po Valley, uh, which was a flat plain. And what we were trying to do was to dislodge those Germans who were so well entrenched and getting them, moving them north into that Po Valley where we had armament. We felt that we could cut them to pieces if we could get them in the Po Valley. And <clears throat> the result was that the commander uh, of the 15th Air Force, a fellow by the name of Nathan Twining, uh, said we what we are going to do is we're going to have a maximum effort uh, and we are going to try to dislodge those Germans uh, from the Apennines and we're going to keep at it until we do it and we're going to fly every airplane that will fly whether it is uh, made for armament to have the armament or whether it's just whether they use those for transporting if they fly and can carry bombs, they're going to go. Yeah. And the result was that that was a thousand plane uh, operation. Wow. Wow. And uh, that was a pretty big operation. Yeah. 
for us in the 15th Air Force back in 1944. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, we, I remember, we were given uh, our coordinates. We flew from our base out to a coordinate in the Adriatic Sea, and from there we made a, a, a turn and went in uh, over the Apennine Mountains and over our own troops, which was a dangerous thing because if anybody dropped a bomb, they'd be dropping on our people. Wow. So it was a very, very careful, yeah. carefully, carefully planned. And <clears throat> anyway, um, we, on, we began our mission taking off and <laughs> the planes were, were able to take off about every three minutes. Uh, you can't get too get close to the one in front of you because <clears throat> these four uh, engines developed quite a, what we call prop wash. And uh, of course that would, uh, you, you couldn't control the plane if you hit the prop wash. So yeah. <clears throat> every three minutes the planes would take off and and they would go up into a formation. But the problem was that as we went down the runway, our number three engine uh, was not putting out the necessary volume that we had it. And we, we, we had a full load of bombs and we needed every bit of it, every bit of it. So <coughs> we uh, had a prearranged signal that when something like that happened, we fire a flare. So the people behind us would not come, uh, uh, and we uh, uh, reduced our speed and turned off of the, the runway, and we uh, got a, a spare plane and uh, re got all the stuff on it that we needed to get, including the bombs load, and uh, we went and joined the uh, the formation. No, well, but not really, but we. The formation had gone on, and we were able to get to that point in the Adriatic really before the formation, because the formation is very slow. It takes a long time to get a whole bomb group up in the air and all flying. It takes, yeah. golly, I, I would guess, you know, for all of them, it must take pretty close to 45 minutes or an hour or oh, something okay. to get to get them all together, and so we had that extra amount of time. We go directly to that coordinate. So we did, and uh, <clears throat> when we got up there to that coordinate, it was important for us to try to find our own group. The reason being that we were loaded for anti-personnel bombs. Some of the group was loaded for heavy bombardment, and. Uh, so <clears throat> we, we kept looking, trying to see if we could find our own group. And I, I remember <laughs> we had a, a, a bombardier who, <laughs> whose name was Moriarty. <laughs> and I'll never forget Moriarty. <laughs> we, we were up at, you know, at altitude with our oxygen on the time. And we asked uh, Moriarty to get up in the there was a little place, uh, of a dome right in front of where we were flying the plane that the navigators would shoot the stars. And I said, well, get a pair of binoculars, binoculars and see if you can get the readings on the thing. And we'd like to try to, to get with our own group. And uh, so uh, Moriarty got up there and we could see him and he was looking all over. He could not find an airplane, and there were literally uh, there were a thousand planes in the air, and uh, they were not all at once. You know they were coming, but he he could never find one. <laughs> so we said, said, I don't know what was wrong with his eyesight, but anyway, we said he had to get a, a walk around oxygen bottle and bring the binoculars up to the command group so that we could find, and we did find our group and we did go in and drop our bombs as we were supposed to. But uh, that was one, one sort of amusing incident that we had.
uh, and we were able to get by, <laughs> get get back, and all in one piece. No, Mr. Moriarty notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs> now, what was your position on the crew? Were you pilot? Uh, we did. I did at one time. I was a pilot. One time, I was a navigator, okay. a co-pilot. Okay. Uh, we uh, flying a B-24 was a, a matter of, of real uh, exertion. It was uh -huh. that plane was. Um, it was a heavy. It, well, it was like driving a truck. Okay, uh, and it was a you. You had to use your the rudders. Uh, it was the yeah. amount of the huh. exertion. What we did, we we flew, fifteen minute intervals. Okay. Uh, we, we, the pilot would fly, fifteen minutes, and when he flew, he had his radio tuned in to the rest of the uh, bomb group. Okay. The, Fellow who was not flying was on the the intercom with all of the crew, so that he could be in oh, command God. of the crew. Yeah. Then, when the other fellow had finished his 15 minutes, we'd switch it around, okay. and this, he, this guy would go yeah. on the uh, thing for the rest of the mom group, and and so we. The only exception to that was that when we had reached what they call the IP or the initial point. The initial point being the, the, the time at which the navigator, uh, the bombardier, takes over the plane from the initial point because he is uh, using his Norden bomb site to direct and get the, the exact coordinate that hit, would hit the, yeah. the So uh, when whoever was uh, actually acting as a pilot at, at the time of the IP, he retained that until such time as we the bombs had, had been dropped okay. and we were gone. Yeah. Okay. And that's how we, we operated. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether every crew did that, but right. I, that's how we did it. Right. And uh, <clears throat> uh, we have had, had uh, you know, several kind of close calls. Uh, and that, we did not on that Particular mission, I, we 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 were not in any danger uh, of you know crashing or anything. But we did have a, a mission at one time where we were bombing uh, the uh, a line of uh, uh, railroad line that went from uh, Italy through the Alps and on up into uh, Austria and Germany and. Uh, <coughs> The Germans had put their anti-aircraft up on the top of the mountains, and uh, uh, the mountains were pretty high. So even though we were flying pretty high, they weren't all that. We weren't all that far, mm -hmm. and uh, we had. I guess of our closest call was on that. We had uh, the bomb uh, uh, exploded, and usually, I guess. The bombs were usually maybe went off above and it sprinkled down, but this one was below us, and when it went off, but it was very close, and instead of going uh, like mo some of them did, going all of that was went down, but the the pressure from that was up, and our plane shoot, shot up uh, significantly and. Uh, the, the whole plane rattled, and uh, we were wondering if we hoped that nobody had been hit. But fortunately, we weren't. It was most of that had gone down. Yeah. But the Germans at that time, they were, they were, well, you have to give them credit, they're a smart bunch of people. They developed a thing called a proximity fuse. And the reason that that was important was that uh, when we were flying, if we could see we're being shot at, we uh, we could take evasive action. Okay. But this proximity fuse was such that you didn't know you were going to be shot at until you were all being hit. Oh. So that was a it was a pretty significant improvement for the Germans to have made a such a thing. Did you know they had that when you went up? We, we 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 didn't know it to be at the beginning, but we we knew it afterwards, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, we, we were 
<laughs> we were afraid of it. I yeah, tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but what we normally did when we were getting ready to to go on to our bomb run and just before we got to that IP or the initial point, we dropped up what we called a lot of chaff, which was a lot of uh, um, uh, metal yeah. fill, uh, yeah. things of that kind to upset the uh, right. uh, the radar that yeah. they were using. Yeah. And uh, it was it was effective to a degree, but uh -huh. you know, obviously not not a hundred percent. But uh, anyway, we 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 used it all the time. Yeah. Um, I don't know if anything. Uh, did you have any other close calls? Well, we had had uh, yes, uh, yes and no. I guess not from the Germans, but I do remember. We, when we were bombing uh, an area away, far away from our base, uh, it was like a 12-hour mission uh, from from start to finish, and um, uh, <clears throat> we would start, we would get get up in the morning like five o'clock, and uh, and uh, at six o'clock we would have a. Uh, they would tell us where we were going and how to do it, and <clears throat> and we would go uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of six o'clock in the morning and return around six o'clock in the evening. And uh, the the motors that we had, and the engines and the thing, were pretty, they used a lot of fuel. Uh, I think, if I remember correctly, we had about which each plane had about 3,500 gallons of fuel. And in the formation flying, what it looks like it's very easy. It's, it, when you're flying, it, you, you're constantly jockeying your throttles, and that uses a lot of fuel. And particularly when you're on your flying, you're pulling, you're going up to this way and uh, using a lot, and you, you, you have a full bomb load. And, uh, and so, <clears throat> we we found ourselves running out of gas, and uh, I remember coming back. We were we think we didn't think we could make it, and uh, that we decided that there was a little uh, airfield on a little island in the Adriatic called Vis, V I S, and it was a fighter field, which was much shorter than what we were accustomed to, but it was, it was, we didn't have much of a choice. So we decided we would, we better go in and, and land there and see if we couldn't get some more fuel. So we did, and uh, we were able to get in safely. And it was a rather interesting thing that we found down there. That, <laughs> this island, which was, uh, I'll say, off of the coast of Yugoslavia at that time, and uh, it was controlled by a group of people called, uh, they were Tito uh, yeah. people, and uh, they were against the Germans, and they uh, they had a lot of little boys, which I think they were 12, 14 years old or something, and they, they, these are the kids that went out and they were, they were doing their reconnoitering to see that they were not yeah. find in German. Huh. Anyway, I remember they had these sort of bandoliers, and they had these, they had uh, round balls this way. And we saw, well, what, what, what are those? And said, well, those were the hand grenades. And uh, so we, we we we'd never seen one like that. Our hand grenades was. Uh, Completely different. Yeah. It was a thing that had all sorts of things. You pulled this jerk and then you waited and you threw it, and it and it was time. Yeah. But this was different. They they this this was about the size of a <coughs> small orange, and they they cut the top of that orange off this way, and in the middle of it was a was a plunger. And so when they got ready to throw the, the hand grenade, they would unscrew this thing 
and they would throw the hand grenade, and it, when it rolled over, it hit that plunger. Oh, huh. And this little boy was I was showing us this. I got 14 years old or so. He was showing it, and they see he was showing it. All you had to do was, you know, hit that. And well, yeah, fine. <laughs> put that thing back on. <laughs> <laughs> but that was our experience in the island of Vist. We did have ga get gasoline, and we got back. <laughs> Bill, was that the same time that didn't one of your engines at one point go out? The, it was the same island that uh, that I, I didn't get the your qu the question that you did, didn't you at one on one mission an engine went completely out. Did you lose an engine on one of your missions? Right. No, no, we, we we never missed it. We never we never had an engine go out on us. The the, the engine that we had that didn't pull, we, we we never got off the ground. We 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 fired the flare and uh, and got a got another plane. Huh. We, we that uh, we were fortunate. We didn't. Uh, every once in a while, you know, we, somebody would would take it and get a. Uh, they'd have to feather. The plane by feathering it, they, it, what that did was the, the propeller would would turn so that the, the 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 flat part of it was going head directly into the wind. So that that stabilized instead of having the thing, the wind yeah. doing this way, it stabilized it and kept it oh. uh, huh. without Stable, turning. Yeah. But, did you lose many planes in your group? Well, it, the what I understand was that from the statistic from the 15th Air Force, they tell us that the, the, the loss of the, of the overall loss was five percent per mission, and at the time that I was flying, uh, the 30 missions were the goal. Uh, uh, so that it, at the end of 30 missions, you had completed your okay. assignment and you were sent back for reassignment to the state. Uh, I never finished the 30 missions. I finished 21 missions. And uh, even so, at 5%, we were a little over the 100. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but we, we uh, some of the missions were were real bad. Uh, the ones that uh, the ones that, the, were uh, heavily bomb, heavily uh, uh, anti-aircraft yeah. were. Uh, they were tough, and uh, they would. We would see other other groups going through there. We would see all that. It was black smoke. Yeah. And, uh, my first time I saw one of those. They, I, and see how we were going to be able to get through, but we yeah. did it, yeah. and uh, uh, it was a struggle uh, to keep your flying steady and not cut off and do something else. But took a lot of mental discipline, I would think. It, it, that's right, and uh, what <coughs> they did, I think, was uh, each time that a plane people would come in as new, they would. They would separate the and send them each with another crew that had been through this uh, before, so that they would give them a little idea that you know the first thing that would come to your mind was, hey, you you can't survive that. You better get out. But you can't, can't you can't do that. And that was the, the one thing that uh, there was bad about about a heavy bombardment. You you had to fly at a certain place in order to hit a certain target. Mm. And the Germans knew darn well mm. what we were trying to do. Yeah. We did have one thing that I think that was interesting, maybe of interest to you, and that was that when we took off in formation, we would go like we were going to, to bomb a certain city, uh, maybe a marshalling yard or whatever. Yeah. and. Uh, we would go like we were going to do that, and the people down there were then upset. They had to leave and go into the bomb shelters and whatnot. We had no intention of bombing them. Huh. And we go and do the same thing oh. with 
this thing. This two or three times we would do this <laughs> to, uh, to inhibit the yeah. war effort. Yeah. And uh, huh. and we we thought it was successful. I'm 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 sure it was to a degree anyway. That's interesting. I've yeah. never heard that. <laughs> yeah, right. Now, where were you bombing primarily? What what areas? Well, uh, we uh, the whole area. We we went from southern Italy uh, over uh, to let's see east over to uh, areas around Ploesti, which was a oil field, yeah. up uh, up to Germany, Austria. Oh. Uh, Oh. That was mainly, I guess, Germany and Austria were our two main things when I was there. Uh, Ploesti was a was a prime target, and the, the guys that uh, I have a brother-in-law who was a uh, an, on a navigator that hit Ploesti six times, Gee. and uh, that was a uh, that was a main oil refinery, and uh, boy, they really. You can imagine how well defended that was, and uh, boy, that was a, that. I did, we, I never went on a Poes degree, mm -hmm. but uh, our, our bomb group did, wow. uh, and uh, that was a tough one, a real tough one. Yeah. Wow. You said you had 21 missions. Yes. Uh, what happened after your 21st? Well, uh, <coughs> we. When we would go into a, um, a briefing of where we were going to bomb, that, there was a, a big map, a huge map, uh, and on this side over here was England, and on this side over here was uh, Russia, and they had a bomb line that was down this way, and everything on this side of the the bomb line was enemy, and as each as the troops on the ground became closer and closer to the Russians, and, the, and this way the bomb line uh. got to come up, and finally the bomb line met. Uh. And when that happened, Germany was was over, and uh, there was no, nothing further. Uh, the at that particular day. You would think there would be great rejoicing. Yeah. There wasn't. Not a single one. We we were called together, and not a cheer. And our commanding officer said that the Germans had unconditionally surrendered, and that we will begin this afternoon training for for flying to the Pacific. Uh. And if the, you know, if the only other questions were that we would not be flying qu quite as tight a formation <coughs> in the Pacific as we had been because we did not expect to have uh, interceptions by the, like the Germans had had. We didn't think the Germans, the, the Japanese were capable of that. Yeah. But So that was it. In the afternoon we were then went up trying with flying formation the way that we were going to do when we were moved to the Pacific. That was it. And of course, in, we were going to be given, and we're given, we flew home, flew our own planes home. Back to the States? Back to the States. And we were given a 30-day leave, and during that period of 30-day leave, they dropped the A-bomb. Oh. And from that moment on, it was it was apparent that uh, we were not going to be moved to the Pacific. And I was sent down to Moultrie, Georgia, and uh, we were, and that was a little field down there that I was uh, in charge of some people down there, and that's where I stayed until <clears throat> I got out at Fort McPherson, <laughs> and uh, I got out on a Saturday. <clears throat> and I went to see my mother in Charlotte, and I spent Saturday evening and Sunday with her. And <clears throat> on Monday evening, on Sunday evening, I got on a bus and I went to Chapel Hill, North Carolina. I did not know a soul, but Sunday mor Monday morning was the, the start of a new semester, so I started 
and the best thing that ever happened to me, I met my future wife <laughs> <laughs> in Chapel Hill. And from there, I've, yeah. 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 Well, I want to go back, ask you a couple of questions. Okay. Several months before that. Where were you when you heard that Normandy had been invaded? You had not been, you weren't in Italy yet, were you? When Normandy, let's see, Normandy would be in June of 1944. Right. And I was uh, getting my flying wings at that time at Eagle Pass, Texas. And uh, I, at that point, uh, I had fully expected to be a hot rock pi uh, fighter pilot, which I probably wasn't, but I <laughs> thought I was. I thought I was anyway. <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, I, I, at Normandy, I think that's where I was in Eagle Pass, Texas. Talk about the, your reaction and the reaction of people around you when you heard we had hit the beaches of Normandy. Well. All I could think of um, was uh, those fellows hitting the beaches. Uh, I remember that since the war, I've been able to travel over there, and I have been to Normandy. And anyone who has not been to Normandy, please yeah. go to Normandy and look to see what those boys did. You want to understand, they were just boys, too. Yeah. Those were boys, and we, we were boys. Uh, I was 20 years old when I was doing this, and, wow. uh, you know, just wet behind the ears, and most of us were. But boys, and, and I, when, when I went over and saw Normandy, and I saw the defenses that they had, and the cliffs that those fellows had to climb in, and, and with guns pointing down on them, I I really don't I I don't see how any human being had the guts to do what they did. Yeah. I really don't. It's just amazing yeah. to me, and it, it it brings tears to your eyes if if you see what it, it's. Please, if you haven't done that, do it before you yeah. die because yeah. it's something you ought to see. You're right. Well, it must have been quite an adjustment. You know, one month you're dropping bobs and being shot at, and a couple of months later you're in class. What, what kind of, how did you adjust to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I, I have to say that when you're dropping bombs, and in the, main, and in the meantime you're being shot at, you, you don't, I, I never really had a lot of uh, empathy for the people down below. They, they were shooting at me, and all I wanted to do was to hit our target and get the devil out of there. Yeah. And that's what we really did as the, the formation was going along, and they have to be at a certain spot in order to hit the target. But when those bombs are dropped, usually then everybody pushes the nose of the plane down, increases the speed, and gets out from this area of being uh, where the anti-aircraft was uh, so yeah. thick. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I wish if I would uh, be a better person, perhaps I would be be a little bit concerned about the people on the ground, but I was more concerned about yes. what, what I was going to be hit. Right. That's, that's very understandable. That's, that's, that's the truth, and it's not a very admirable situation, I guess, but that's the way it was. Well, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure everybody in your position felt the same way. <laughs> yeah. Talk about your life after the military. You met your wife at yeah. a certain point. Well, as I said, I, I, uh, I met my wife uh, at the University of North Carolina. And um, she uh, was from Atlanta, an uh, old Atlanta family. And uh, I was hired by 
a, a company with had its headquarters in Atlanta, and uh, so as I returned down to Atlanta, I uh, renewed my our acquaintance, and we we dated, and, and dating back in those days was quite a bit different, I guess, from what it is today. Nobody had automobiles. And I worked in the old Rhodes Haverty building, and my wife worked at Rich's. Wow. And uh, so she got off before I did. And uh, we met after we'd have a little dinner and go to a movie. And uh, then I, we would go down to Mitchell Street and take a streetcar and her house was right across the street from the East Lake Country Club. Oh, yeah. And uh, that's where the, the the line of the streetcar ended. And so I, <coughs> we stayed there, and, and when the streetcar came, and the, when the last one came, I could hear him changing the seats, going back, <laughs> changing from this way to that way, so they were going that way, and they had to, had to take the trolley down on one and put her back in the other. Oh. Now I had to be down there to get that that last train from Madrid because I I, I lived in uh, out in a different area, so I had to, I had to get on that that last bus. Or you'd be walking. Right? Or I'd be walking. That's right. <laughs> there were no automobiles that could be bought for whatever price. <laughs> so did you continue to live in Atlanta? And so I did. It, I did. I had a place in Atlanta, and uh, I went on back and. And uh, ultimately, we we decided to get married, which we uh, we did in uh, 1946, six, seven, six. We've been married 66 years. I can't remember Boy. quite. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> but anyway, we we have, we have been happily married, and uh, we have. Uh, three children and four grandchildren and three great grandchildren and uh, our, uh, we have uh, my grandchildren we have a, a fellow who's a, a veterinarian and another fellow who's a, a navy pilot and uh, two girls uh, wow so uh, we we have a great family. I know you're proud of them. We are <laughs> very proud. Well, you've had an amazing life and well, still having it. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 it doesn't seem all amazing to me, but it well, uh, it, do, it does to me. Yeah, it does. <laughs> Can I go back to Italy just a second, <clears throat> Bill? <clears throat> the Japanese American soldiers were in Italy. I believe there was a battle at the Rapido River. I think Jim or Dole, the senator, was, was all part of that. Did you have any interaction with, with that element of Italy? Or? We, we didn't. Uh, we, we didn't really have any interaction with any other uh, of the military people besides the Air Force. We were, as I say, we were we were billeted on on two hills, and uh, they were both. One was a bomb group, and another was a bomb group, and uh, that was the only people we ever saw. Um, so I I don't I it would not know. Uh, I I do know that where I live now, talking about the Japanese, uh, there's a Japanese couple that live. But where I do in in uh, Lindbrook, they were uh, in Hawaii and and uh, when the, when the bomb when the Japanese hit on December seventh, and I think I'm not sure about this, but I'm pretty sure they were confined to a degree yeah. because they were Japanese. After the war, the man became an army uh, officer. I don't know what his rank was, but a pretty good rank. But his son, who is a second generation, is a lieutenant general in the United States Army, and he was invited. Well, he, I guess he came to visit his parents, but they invited him to 
make a speech and uh, at Lindbrook, they were hanging on most of the rafters to hear this oh. sound. He was a very, very sharp young man. I bet that was interesting to hear yes, his perception. Yes, right. Perspective. Absolutely. Second question, Bill. <clears throat> um, I've been to Normandy, and I agree you have to be there to fully understand it. Um, do you believe, or do you, do you have an opinion on whether or not World War II is properly being taught? It's being properly remembered, I'm sure of that, especially by those of us that are older. But do you believe as time goes by that the millennials and the others are really being taught the sacrifices and what actually really happened in that four short years. You mean, do you think that the media has... Uh, uh, Just in general, do you think the young people, like when I uh, was growing up, World War II was very recent. My father had been in it. Yeah. And down in Savannah where I grew up, you could see men well, missing legs. Well, my but feeling... Nowadays, of, do people remember... My feeling years? about World War II is that I, I think it, it, it was a hundred percent of our people were behind the military services and what we were trying to do. Um, I, I think in in subsequent military problems that we had, that they, that might not have been the case. I'm sure it was not, but. But I, I, I think as far as uh, World War II, I don't know how it's being taught, but I, 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 don't, I think that it, it, it was 100% uh, American. I don't think anybody was against it. I, I think everybody was down the line, and I don't really see how that could possibly be anything but right. Well, the good thing about you telling your story is people down through the years are going to hear exactly what happened. Yes. You know, they're, they're not going to pay as much attention to somebody that wasn't there or just right. you know, a historian right. who wasn't right. even born then. Right. They're going to hear it from people right. like you yeah. who were there. Yeah. Well, I think, in, like in <clears throat> maybe in the Korean War, the Vietnam War, perhaps uh, we had so many people who felt differently about, uh, about going into a war than which you didn't expect to win. Uh, I mean, you couldn't win uh, like a war against the Chinese if you couldn't hit the Chinese, and you know, they had, could keep. They have millions and billions of people yeah. that can just keep coming at. Yeah. So I, I, I can see how that would be, but we didn't have that in World War Two. Yeah. I mean, everybody who was against Hitler, everybody was against the Japanese. Yeah. Uh, so it was a. Yeah, I don't think there's any misconceptions yeah. about either of those. Yeah. Well, I want to give everybody else a chance to ask any questions that you have. Can I just ask one question, Mr. McManus? You certainly can. I know that there was some significant equipment that you had to carry, personal equipment you had uh -huh. to have on the B-24 uh -huh. to be able to survive at the altitude and do what you need. How, was that a, a pain in the neck? What? How did that work? Well, <clears throat> we had what we call survivor kits. And... Uh, um, they had <clears throat> food in it, and uh, I don't remember if there was anything liquid in it, but I do remember there was food. And one thing they did put in those survivor kit, w they put money, and, and they were gold certificate money. When you take out your dollar bill now and you look at it, there's a, there's a green seal on it. but. The money that they gave us was was uh, refundable in gold, and so they figured that if we were got we were down and they would be maybe helping people, they they would be more interested in in the gold, and so we had we had gold certificates huh. in that. Well, of course, that wasn't something that was uh, we had this little survival kit. And of course, we we all had we wore parachutes the whole time. Uh, we did have uh, oxygen. The oxygen was we we normally would when we got up to around fifteen thousand feet, everybody was required to uh, have their oxygen. And 
one of the crew members was uh, designated as a, a person who would would uh, ask for the, each other crew members to to come in to sign in to d determine whether they were okay with the oxygen. You see, the oxygen <coughs> is something that if you don't have, you don't know it. And uh, you can die before you realize that you don't have it. And as a result of that, uh, we, we, would have, we had this oxygen thing going every few minutes. Uh, we would say, uh, the, the pilot, the engineer, uh, oh, oxygen check, okay. And then we'd go to the, the, to the various gunners and everybody would, would check in. Uh, the one that did it on our crew was our bombardier, and he he, he checked it out every, uh, I guess every five or ten minutes we checked that to be, because huh. you you really don't. Well, <laughs> one of the things that we we had happened when we were in training, uh, all the pilots said this, they <clears throat> they put us in a decompression uh, chamber. And they pumped all the air out of it, and but the, you, you were sitting in there with your oxygen, and so you didn't know. So they pumped it out to what would be the equivalent of something like forty-five thousand feet, uh, and then they would ask for a volunteer, and they say, "All right, now this guy." And they, of course, if you're a volunteer, you got off of some of the duties that you had to perform, like KP or something. You they, you were exempt from that because you volunteered, but. We'd say, all right, now there's a volunteer. Here is a pad of paper and a pencil, and we want to write. You want you to write your name down ten times. And they would take the oxygen mask off. And you know, of course, he would the first one time or two he would write his name down very well. When he got on down the line, you couldn't even read it. God. And the thing was, that the, and he didn't know it. And they said, at any time that you feel that you need oxygen, you put your oxygen mask on. Never saw anybody ever do that. God. They had to actually put it back on. So the point of that I'm making is that it was necessary to continually check for oxygen because yeah. you could be in trouble and not know it, yeah. and that is absolutely the case. And they had that the guy, the, the great golfer, that, that was uh, that had the same the, thing the happened. Yeah. And, they, and they, I think all of them were out of oxygen, and the plane was flying along on mm. oxygen, on an automatic pilot, and uh, not every single one of them was gone. The plane was flying beautifully, so it wasn't anything. Thing, but just uh, did you show your picture? Um, oh, not yet. Yeah. Uh, the picture. Well, we want you to show your picture of, oh, your, of yeah. your plane. Yes, this this is a picture, not of the my the one my yeah. plane, but the the type of plane. And describe the the plane. Right. Just this this is a B twenty four, and uh, it's it's called a Liberator, and I'm told that there were more of these planes manufactured than any other plane in World War Two. They uh, they were built uh, much more rapidly uh, than uh, the old B-17, which had been on the drawing board for 10 or 15 years before the war, and uh, over the years had been uh, modified and, and improved. It was a great airplane. Uh, this one was uh, designed and built but very much more quickly. Yeah. and. Uh, and how, how many crew members? Ten. Okay. And Bill, what was the purpose of the double uh, horizontal stabilizer? The double. Well, you mean the tail? The tail? Yeah. Uh, aerodynamic. I, I I can't answer that. Uh, I I would assume that it had had it was a problem. I I do know this that I've seen a lot of those things where at least one of them was shot off and still flying. Which uh, give you maybe an answer of why, why they had two. Huh. Wow. The, uh, the wings on this uh, airplane were called a Davis airfoil. 
and they are very much thinner than most of the bombers, like a B-17. Uh, they, they, when the plane is, uh, B-24 is on the ground, the wings are completely uh, level with the light, with the land. Uh, they, they do not have any what we call dihedral. But uh, I don't know whether you can see it in this picture or not. But as the plane uh, is in the air, the, the wings go up this way significantly, and I've seen the ends of the, each of those wings flap a little bit huh. that way. So, so the wings, is, this is a quite a, uh, the gas tanks were in this, in the wings of the oh, okay. And uh, and uh, no, another thing about the head on these on the wings of these planes was a rubberized version on the front, <coughs> which was to, when when you ran into ice, you, they, they could, those rubber versions could be activated and they would push the ice oh. up to catch the wind and it would flick the yeah. ice off, and which would make the plane wow. fly better than being loaded with ice. Have you been in one since the war? Been in where? Have you been in a B-24 since the war? Uh, I have not. Uh, I, I felt that I, <laughs> I did my bit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't and, want to uh, press your luck, right? <laughs> uh, and I take it off, take my hat off to anyone who wants to do some more, but I, <laughs> I think I've done mine. <laughs> well, does anybody have any more questions? What? Well, Number one, I want to give you a chance to say anything else you want to say before we finish. Any message you want to deliver or anything you want to say? Well, uh, I really hadn't thought about making a statement or not, but um, I do know that uh, the guys that I went in service with, were, they were a great bunch. And as I say, we were all boys, and we were all wet behind the ears. We were all scared to death. And anybody that says they weren't is a dadgum liar. Mm -hmm. But uh, we managed, and and, and I, I have great respect for people in the service then and now. And I guess that's my statement. <laughs> well, I, I can't think of a better statement to make, and I, I, I want to thank you for agreeing to sit down and tell your story. And you're, like most veterans, you're very modest, but you're obviously a very courageous man. I mean, <laughs> well, you, I'm not sure about that well, either. <laughs> after I hearing did what, what I had to do, and well, when you have to do something, you, whether you whether you're courageous or whether you're scared <laughs> to death, you got to do gotta it. You got to do it. That's right. <laughs> Uh, well, I want to say this, that uh, what I have told you about the mission is uh, replicated in that thing to a degree. Okay. And I felt that uh, that was, when I did that, I, of the missions that I recounted, uh, that one perhaps would be something of interest to more people than simply going over and bombing a bunch of rail yards or something. So uh, I, I, I have repeated that, and well, I hope that's all right with you, because, but anyway. <laughs> no, we, we would have been uh, disappointed if you hadn't. And, uh, <laughs> you, you do a great job of telling the story, and yeah. particularly the emotions. I mean, you've, you really yeah. describe yeah. the emotions you had in different situations, yeah. that your fellow soldiers, fellow yeah. pilots, and right. that's going to mean a lot to the people that see this down the yeah, years. Right. I mean, they really get a feel yeah. of what it was like, yeah. and uh, I, I just want to, number one, thank you for coming in here well, and telling your story, yeah. and then finally, I just want to thank you for your service and everything you did for your country. Well, it's been my pleasure, and I mean, it's a pleasure to see you folks, and and especially for those who are volunteering this, I think it's, you know, everyone owes a debt of gratitude. Wow. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Yeah. McManus, that was yeah. wonderful. That was great. That really was.